Thank you for joining us today for this webinar on working with elderly victims. As part of the 2015 White House Conference on Aging, the Department of Justice committed to providing training on elder abuse for prosecutors, victim specialists, law enforcement, and others. The Executive Office for United States Attorneys, in conjunction with the Department of Justice's Elder Justice Initiative, is presenting this webinar as part of this important effort. We have a wonderful panel of experts today who will share their experiences working with elderly victims and advice for those ho hoping to serve elderly victims better. My name is Kate Manning. I'm an attorney advisor for the Victim Witness Staff at the Executive Office for United States Attorneys. Joining me today will be Maria Schumar, the Victim Specialist Consultant for the DOJ Elder Justice Initiative, Joanne Stewart, Chief of the Victim Witness Assistant Unit Assistance Unit at the United States Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia, Chris Griffiths, Victim Witness Program Manager for the United States Attorney's Office in the Middle District of Florida, and Felice Weiler, Victim Witness Specialist for the United States Attorney's Office in the Northern District of Illinois. To help set the frame so we understand the importance of this issue, I'd like to share with you some statistics about elderly abuse. Only one in 24 cases of elder abuse are reported according to the Justice Department and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Prosecution and victim witness staff need to be vigilant in assisting this underserved and often vulnerable population. The victim witness staff can play an important role in helping both the crime victim and the prosecutor as cases progress. We need to remember that seniors have the same rights as adults and children and that penalties for elder abuse crimes can be enhanced. The Census Bureau projects that in 2030, 20.3% of the U.S. population will be aged 65 or older. With an increase in seniors comes an increased risk of crime for this group. Elder abuse affects about 5 million Americans each year. There's a reluctance to report this type of crime due to shame, ties to the abuser, fear of retaliation, and a host of other reasons. To talk more about the types of elder abuse, I'd like to turn to Maria Schumar. Thanks, Kate. So what is elder abuse? Physical abuse is the intentional use of force that results in pain or injury or even death. Sexual abuse is any non-consensual sexual act, and this would include forcing a senior to view pornography or forcing a senior to pose in a pornographic photo or film. Financial abuse is the improper use of an older person's money or property for one's own profit. Neglect is the failure to provide the basic needs, such as food, shelter, clothing, medicine. This also includes abandonment, which would be forcing a senior to stay at a facility like an emergency room for hours on end. Emotional or psychological abuse causes suffering or distress through verbal, such as a threat or nonverbal, such as a threatening look, um, means. Most of the victims I've met say that the psychological abuse was actually worse for them than the physical abuse was. See the Elder Justice Initiative site for more detailed information on the types of elder abuse. So how are cases of elder abuse referred to victim specialists? They get cases through their supervisors, assistant U.S. attorneys, law enforcement such as FBI, IRS, Postal Inspection Service, local police. They get cases through private victims programs and shelters, long-term care facilities and ombudsmen, domestic violence programs, Department of Aging, and more. And what do Assistant U.S. Attorney say about having a victim specialist on an elder abuse case. A senior prosecutor at the U.S. Attorney's Office commented that having a victim specialist assigned to a case involving an elder greatly assists the prosecution and the prosecutor in particular. An elder victim can have issues that would not be readily apparent to the prosecutor who may have no experience at all working with elder victims. The victim specialist receives specialized training to look for issues particularly present in this population. These issues could include shame, embarrassment, physical pain, isolation, fear, mobility issues, mental health issues, 
cognitive issues, and more. With this specialized knowledge, the victim specialist can educate the prosecutor on how best to interview the victim and explain the process to the victim, preparing the victim for grand jury or trial. In addition, due to the strong bond that is typically formed between the victim specialist and the victim, the victim specialist can provide invaluable assistance to the victim both before and during trial. How can victim witness specialists assist in elder abuse cases? Well, early assignment of a case, of a victim specialist on a case is very important. Don't wait till the last minute to assign a specialist to your case. It's important to do it at the beginning because the victim specialist can establish a rapport and a relationship with the elder and address issues that might be present at that time that might become obstacles later on. A victim witness specialist can assist in a case by ensuring that the Department of Justice Attorney General guidelines are met. They can provide for the needs of the senior, such as transportation, to interviews, to court, wheelchair accessibility, hearing devices. They can do safety planning with the senior based on the type of crime and offer resources to the senior, such as appropriate housing and shelter, counseling, referrals to crime victim programs. See the Elder Justice Initiative site or resource list. Victim witness staff can inform the prosecutor of the disclosure of new crimes and report crime outside their prosecution authority to the appropriate agency. For instance, if you're prosecuting a case of financial abuse and you learn that the senior is being physically abused by their son, you can make sure that Adult Protective Services is notified, the local police or the local prosecution unit. Victim witness staff can educate assistant U.S. attorneys and others in their office on the danger of stereotyping of seniors. Everyone ages differently, <clears throat> and a decline in decision making does not always mean they have Alzheimer's disease. A senior may never have been to a prosecutor's office before, may not be familiar with what happens there. They may be in shock, confused, ashamed, or in denial. And victim witness staff can make sure that other staff are made aware of this, ensuring sensitivity and respect. Older crime victims may require more time in an interview. Victim witness specialists can ensure that adequate time is allotted for questions and answers and make sure the senior understands the legal terminology. If not, repeat in lay terms and have them repeat it back to you if you're not sure. Other special considerations when meeting an elderly crime victim is to be respectful. Always refer to the senior as Mr. or Mrs. or Ms. and do not use first names. Introduce yourself and explain your role. They may never have been to a prosecutor's office before and not really understand what's going on. Use your listening skills and watch their body language. Validate the senior. Let them know you are listening and that you care. Check regarding vision, hearing, health, and medication needs. Some seniors are more alert in the morning because they've just taken their medication, and that might be the best time to interview them or have them testify at court. You also want to check regarding family members. If a senior shows up with family, you want to make sure that you separate them immediately. Seniors may be reluctant to disclose information in front of their family. They might be ashamed or embarrassed. And then again, there might be trust issues within the family, so you want to make sure that you separate them before interviewing. In a courtroom setting, make sure the senior is comfortable and knows what to expect. Explain court etiquette. And there'll be more on this in the case presentations later. In large cases, you want to contact a senior via a call center or by letter or phone rather than by a computer. As seniors, um, well, some seniors may not have access to a computer, and they may not own a computer, and it'd be easier to reach them the other way. Follow up with the senior. Risk of harm or re-victimization could increase once a case is opened. The senior may be in denial, afraid of their abuser, or ambivalent about what to do, and they may maintain contact with the abuser, putting them at greater risk. In vulnerable cases, you want to report to Adult Protective Services. And for state reporting information, see www.ncall.us or www.americanbar.org. 
So now we're going to hear from Jalon Stewart on some cases. Good morning. Um, I want to talk about a case where the defendant and the victim um, had been married for some time and they had had problems in the past. The victim was an elderly woman. On this particular occasion, um, her husband was setting off bug bombs in the apartment in order to extor exterminate for pests. Um, and the, the victim had, had a host of health issues, including respiratory issues, complained to the defendant that the smell was making her ill, and so she went into the bathroom just to escape the smell. Unfortunately, the defendant followed her into the bathroom and then began spraying bug spray in the confined space of the bathroom. The victim had open sores on her arm, and the defendant began spraying her arms with the bug spray. The defendant then punched her in the head twice and left the bathroom. The police were called, uh, and when they arrived on the scene, the smell of pesticides was so strong in the apartment, they could not even safely enter the apartment. Fortunately, one officer went in and quickly brought out the victim. The defendant um, was arrested, and he told the police that he was spraying the victim because she had bugs on her skin, and he admitted that he had been doing that for several months. <coughs> A victim advocate was quickly assigned to this case, and the advocate took action. And one of the most important things we did in this case was to assign an advocate immediately. It's so crucial for the advocate to develop a relationship with the victim right from the start. And the advocate and the prosecutor were able to answer the victim's questions immediately. Um, any questions she had about the criminal justice system were answered. And the advocate was also able to assess her needs, both her emotional needs and her physical needs. The initial conversation with the victim, um, during that conversation, the advocate was able to determine that the victim was going to need a place to live. She could not return safely to uh, her prior home. So the advocate contacted the D.C. Office on Aging to assist with locating a senior apartment for the victim. Unfortunately, there was a waiting list, so the victim was placed on the waiting list immediately. The applicant also contacted Adult Protective Services and reported the crime as she was mandated to do. These were all mandatory reporters. Um, the advocate referred the victim to Crime Victims Compensation and applied for funding to have the victim's lock cha locks changed until she was able to move. And the advocate also immediately provided the victim with a referral to a civil lawyer so that the civil lawyer could seek a CPO and could ex assist the victim with any domestic relations issues that arose during the case. All of this was done in the first 24 hours. Because the victim had such a strong rapport with the victim advocate, the victim disclosed some things to the advocate. Uh, for example, the victim told the advocate that the defendant had showed up at the victim's dialysis appointment and had come to her apartment twice. Uh, and the last time he went to her home, he assaulted her and threatened to kill her. The advocate recognized that this, all of these actions that the defendant took were in violation of the stay-away order that was in place, as well as the TPO, and the advocate immediately reported the new assault to the prosecutor. The prosecutor sought a modification to the defendant's conditions of release, and the prosecutor also filed new charges against the defendant and approved a warrant for the defendant's arrest. When the case went to court, the advocate accompanied the victim to the court hearing and provided emotional support to the victim during the entire encounter. This case was pretty difficult for the victim in a number of ways. Emotionally, she had been with the defendant for more than 30 years, and both emotionally and, and financially were dependent on the defendant. The advocate put as many services in place as possible to help the victim since she had been so dependent on the user. The advocate referred the victim to Bread for the City, which is an, a non-government organization that provides food cards to elderly crime victims. And the advocate also notified the victim when a senior apartment finally became available for the victim. The advocate helped the victim navigate crime victims' compensation, who provided the moving funds for the victim to move to her new apartment, her new senior apartment. Uh, and because the defendant had sprayed all of the victim's furniture with bug spray, the advocate referred the victim to a wider circle, which is an NGO that provides furniture to victims of crime and others in need of furniture. And the advocate also assured that the costs of moving the furniture and having it delivered to the victim were covered as well. All of these things made the criminal justice process much more bearable for the victim, and because the victim's needs had been met, the victim was much more available and ultimately it was a much better witness for the prosecutor. The advocate continued to communicate with the victim long after the case was over in order to assure her well-being. 
In another case involving sexual abuse, uh, an elderly victim who was in her 70s was allowing the defendant, her significantly younger relative, who needed a place to stay, to live with her. And we are seeing more and more of these types of cases where elderly relatives are allowing younger children or grandchildren to live with them, primarily because the elderly uh, victims need assistance and they feel it's better to have a young person around the house with them. In this particular case, the defendant began using drugs and would watch porn in front of the victim. Uh, on, on one occasion, the, the defendant was using drugs, and while he was under the influence, he started accusing the victim of poisoning his food. He grabbed the victim, dragged her into the bedroom, and forcibly sexually assaulted her. Uh, when the defendant was interviewed, he claimed that the encounter was consensual. The victim was absolutely devastated by the sexual attack. She was embarrassed and humiliated and also had um, several physical injuries as a result of the attack. The case was immediately assigned to a victim program spe specialist who met with um, the victim. The program specialist accompanied the victim to a witness conference and was available to support the victim as she testified. It was very clear that the victim needed professional emotional support, so the advocate provided a, re a referral to Crime Victims Comp for assistance with counseling expenses for the victim. The victim no longer felt safe in her home and was ashamed to return to the neighborhood that she had lived in for 40 years. The advocate found resources to help her move, moved her furniture to storage, and then helped her find a safe place to live, and ultimately assisted her in obtaining moving expenses. The defendant went to trial in this case, and trial was very difficult for the victim emotionally. The advocate accompanied the victim to trial and was with her every step of the way throughout the trial. The defendant was ultimately convicted, and the advocate assisted the victim in preparing a victim impact statement. The victim impact statement she gave was, was very powerful, and um, the defendant was sentenced to more than 24 years in prison. Sadly, the victim never returned to her home or the neighborhood where she had lived for decades and was severely impacted by the crime, but the advocate really helped to minimize her pain as she navigated the criminal justice process. Teamwork in this case was absolutely crucial because the prosecutor, the law enforcement partner, and the victim program specialist all worked together to ensure that there were no gaps in services to the victim, and to ensure that she was supported throughout the process. Now I'm going to turn it over to Chris Griffiths, who will talk to you about trial considerations for elderly victims. Thank you, Jalon. Um, I am actually in the Middle District of Florida, so as you can imagine, we frequently have cases involving elderly victims and witnesses, mainly on the fraud side, the financial side. Um, but I wanted to talk to you today about some of the things that we've learned in our district through trial and error and ways that you can help make the process for your victims who do have to testify a little more comfortable. One of the things we have had to use in our district is the Rule 15 video deposition. We've had um, at least one case in which we had a very elderly, frail fraud victim who suffered from some serious medical conditions, was deaf from and blind from birth, and was in a special facility. To move her down to our area to testify would have just been so difficult for her. The prosecutor decided to ask the court to do the Rule 15 video deposition. It worked perfectly. We got the order. The video deposition occurred. The victim was able to present the testimony that was critical and crucial to the case, but also remain in as comfortable as possible under the circumstances. It's just a different mechanism you can use if you have a victim who is just unable to travel for a variety of reasons. But what if you have a victim who can travel? Some of the things you need to think about is do they need a travel companion? Do they need specialized medical equipment while traveling or in the hotel or courtroom? I have found it's best if you try to speak with them personally because frequently in the early stages of the investigation and the case, they may not be comfortable disclosing their special needs to case agents or the prosecutor. There's also um, the ability we have as victim specialists to help the victims feel confident and comfortable in their surroundings. Everyone 
is just able to do a much better job on any kind of level if they feel comfortable and confident in their surroundings. So as a victim specialist, I like to, if possible, give the victim witness a tour of the courtroom in advance, discuss the courtroom security to them, with them, so they're not as intimidated by the checkpoints and the presence of the security staff in the courtroom. If you can, and most of us do have this, a special waiting room helps ease anxiety. Ideally, it should be close to the restrooms and have comfortable chairs. During the presentation of exhibits in a trial, remind the prosecutors to zoom the exhibit if possible, make it as big as possible so that the victim witness can read it more easily and not struggle through that part of it. Remind them to bring a light sweater or a jacket as courtrooms tend to be cool and suggest that they check their medication and make sure they bring it with them and make sure they take it. Also make sure that they eat and drink regularly. Discreetly alert the court to the possible need for comfort breaks. You may have a, a victim who needs to use the restroom more frequently. Just let the court know. You can work out something with the court in advance if that's a situation, but you want to do it discreetly. Um, make sure that the victims have photo identification so they can get through the security checkpoints, and if they don't, find out what you need to do to facilitate their entrance into the courthouse. If possible, let them know the outcome of the trial. This might be an appropriate time to talk to them about the sentencing and probation's role in the sentencing process. Explain to them that they may be contacted by probation and ask for input regarding how the case affected them, not just financially, but also emotionally. Find out if, there's, if they need any additional service referrals. Sometimes They've been okay up until now, but once everything's over, they may experience some distress. They may feel like they need to talk to someone, so now's a good time to bring that up. Confirm and update their notification information in VNS. You know, they may be embarrassed and because of this crime and may not have talked to their family members about it, but once it's over, they may want to include a child or a spouse or some other family member in the victim notification system. It's a, this is a good stage to do it and it's actually very helpful for restitution purposes in the event the victim was awarded restitution but passes away or becomes incapacitated before the restitution is fully paid and collected. I'm now going to turn everything over to Felice Weiler who's going to talk about a highly successful case in her district. Thank you, Chris. I'm going to speak about a large financial fraud case that was handled in the Northern District of Illinois, Chicago. The Defendant's Universal Lease Program was an investment timeshare with actual properties located in Mexico and Panama. Although the defendant lived in Mexico, he was a U.S. citizen. He also held citizenships in both Mexico and Belize. In the Universal Lease Program, victims could either invest an actual amount with a 10% guaranteed return, or enter a lease program which had three options. One, use the room. Two, rent the room. Or three, allow a purported independent management company to rent out the room in exchange for a guaranteed payment. Most victims chose option three, allow the management company to rent out the room in exchange for payment. The defendant promised to buy back 100% of the purchase amount at any time. He was an extremely slick businessman and knew exactly what his elderly investors wanted to hear. The defendant knew that these elderly victims would not be interested in any long-term risky investment plans. He knew that unexpected health issues and a loss of spouse was always a key factor when dealing with the elderly and their money. Elderly victims want to be able to put out, pull out their money at any time without any consequences, and that's exactly what the defendant was offering. The defendant started his scam in the late 1990s. We quickly learned that the defendant coached brokers and victims to finance their investment through their IRAs. We knew that the defendant regularly paid for free trips to Mexico so he could meet with salesmen, investment brokers, and potential victims. The defendant knew that his investment was more believable if he could show off his own personal wealth and the beautiful hotels he was in the process of building. Because of this knowledge, 
we thought we had a sense of who the victims might be, professional, working class folks, and some elderly. And since we knew our victim list was old, we blindly sent out press release asking victims to contact our office if, it, if they did not receive a letter from us. There was an overwhelming outcry for help. I was receiving at least 70 calls a day, probably even more, but 70 was the, was the amount my message box could hold. There wasn't just some elderly. 90% of the calls I received from the retired were from retired elderly, the ones who had worked all their life and saved every penny with no possible way to ever regain their loss. The stories that came in were heartbreaking. Elderly victims being forced out of their homes. Elderly victims no longer being able to live on their own due to lack of finances. Elderly victims not being able to afford medication, chemotherapy, therapy, and worse of all, could not afford to bury their spouse. Couple these hardships with the ones I listed, and you have yourself a complete nightmare, which is exactly what I was experiencing. Although some of the victims had already realized that they had been defrauded, others were clueless and did not want to believe us. Some of the victims had invested their life savings through through a long-time investment broker and refused to believe that this was a scam. Others were suspicious of the fraud, but were ashamed to admit it to their families. How do you tell your spouse of 50 years that your nest egg is gone, or your children that your inheritance that I had always promised you is no longer? We put together an entire package to send out to the victims that included our toll-free contact information, victims' rights, an investigative survey, and a victim impact statement. We also had a system in place in how, we would, how the mail would be reviewed, organized, and stored. Return mail would be skip traced, corrected in VNS, and rerouted back to the victims. I would also put aside two to three hours a day returning phone calls. For victims that were having a hard time coping with their loss, I would research and provide them with contact information for their local senior center and other services in the area. After gathering bins and bins of return surveys and impact statements, we now knew exactly who our victims were and how devastating of an impact this fraud had on their lives. I don't believe when my office took the case that they ever seriously considered restitution. We had 9,000 victims, an old list of names and addresses, and all the defendant's property was in Mexico. This included hotels, businesses, homes, boats, airplane, automobiles, nightclub, and a real estate development project in Cancun. We were clearly out of our realm of expertise. We were pre-warned that no one had ever gotten restitution out of Mexico although numerous attempts had been made by other U.S. Attorney's offices. And the cost to hire a receiver or special master could be astronomical given our situation. And our good intentions could just end up backfiring on us. So the AUSA's agents, myself, got together and discussed restitution, the logical choice versus doing the right thing. The reasoning behind the logical choice far outweighed doing the right thing. But that's what makes our job so interesting and wonderful. We don't always have to take the easy way out. So we decided to roll up our sleeves and do the right thing and go for what we were told was the impossible. We appointed a special master by the court. AUSA's Victim Witness Unit and FBI worked with a special master, providing them with as much useful and organized information as we could. This arrangement was not always a marriage made in heaven. Although our goal was the same, to strip the defendant of his assets, we were in it for two slightly different reasons. The U.S. Attorney's Office and FBI give the money back to the victims. Special Master, give the money back to the victims, but also make some money for ourselves. The U.S. Attorneys closely monitored and oversaw the work of the Special Master, and a flu AUSA was brought into the case. While the FBI continued to conduct interviews and additional investigations, the Victim Witness Unit assisted in taking phone calls, skip tracing addresses, updating addresses, and updating information onto the VNS system. The victims were constantly kept up to date through our hotline. And since the judge was extremely interested in what these elderly victims had to say, he would ask the victim witness unit to reach out to the victims and solicit their opinions during many stages of the case. And although all the elderly do not age the same, please keep in mind when leaving informational messages, talk loud, clear, and slower than normal. 
We collected $50 million, and for the first time, the impossible came possible. Although we were extremely happy with the amount of money we returned to the victims, we quick, quickly learned that for the victims, this still was not enough. After receiving their checks, victims had all sorts of legal questions that, were per, that we were prohibited from answering. Do I still have to pay back my IRA fee? Do I have to claim this money on my taxes? What if I've already written off the money? Now what do I do? The estate is closed. How do I open it back up? We were once again overwhelmed. Then fate took over. We were lucky enough to participate in a pilot program. We were able to obtain pro bono financial planners to answer victim questions. This group of financial planners dedicated two full weekends answering victim calls. They answered all the questions that we were legally prohibited from answering, and they did it for free. They took in just under a thousand calls, and the victims were pleased with their answers. Although this was a one-time shot, referring to someone to talk to a financial financial planner can really be helpful. In the end, we collected $90 million. $70 million went back to the victims. And although I still cringe when I see the number $20 million, I do realize that if it wasn't for the special master, the AUSAs, and the FBI wanting to do the right thing, these amounts would all reach, read zero. And these elderly victims would never have known justice. And now Maria Schumer is going to talk about resources. Thank you so much, Felice. So here are some tips and resources for those that work with elderly victims. The Elder Justice Initiative website has resources nationwide and a section dedicated to prosecution and victim specialists. The website is www.justice.gov backslash elderjustice backslash. Join the Elder Listserv to receive daily emails on what is current in the elder abuse field. You can access that through the through NCEA Elder Listserv. You can sign up that way. Check to see if there is a multidisciplinary elder abuse team in your area, a FAST, which is Financial Abuse Specialist Team, or Elder Abuse Committee. Make important contacts this way and become part of a team that can help make the system work better for the elderly. Attend a training or conference on elder abuse and make new contacts or watch an online training on elder abuse at the um, Elder Justice website or through the NCEA website. Elder abuse shelters are becoming more available. Check for one in your area. And be sure and see the Department of Justice's Elder Justice Initiative site for a comp comprehensive list of resources related to elder abuse victim services, and help for seniors. This site is a work in progress, and notices regarding updates will be going out as it becomes available. And now we're going to hear again from Kate Manning. I hope this webinar has been helpful to you. Thank you so much for joining us and for all of your work for elderly victims.